Go ahead and turn with me in your Bibles to Mark chapter 8. Mark chapter 8, we're going to be picking where, up where we left off a couple weeks ago. Uh, just by way of reminder, Mark 8 uh, brings us to the halfway point in the gospel according to Mark. And it's not just the halfway point, it's also the hinge point. Uh, Mark is pivoting, shifting his focus. In the first eight chapters, he has shown us on page after page, chapter after chapter, the person of Jesus Christ. He's been answering for us the question, who is Jesus? But in the passage we looked at a couple weeks ago, we saw that the, the, the shift is now moving from who Jesus is to what he's come to do, his person now to his work. And of course, that climactic moment at the beginning of chapter 8, uh, or uh, near the end of chapter 8 that we looked at last time about Peter responding rightly to the question, okay, okay, all, all these other people say that you're John the Baptist, one of the prophets, Elijah, you have favorable ratings in the polls, but who do you say I am? And Peter responds, you are the Messiah which is really the high point so far here in the gospel. But as we're going to see, disillusionment, at least for us as readers, quickly sets in because that scene with Peter is not over. Just by way of reminder, if, if you've not been with us for this whole series in Mark, Mark is actually the earliest of the four gospels that we have in the New Testament. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mark was written first, likely in the mid-50s A.D., so this was very early on in, in the, the, the time when many eyewitnesses of Jesus, his person, his work, his majesty would have still been alive. They would have been walking sources, people you could have gone up to and either verified or falsified the stories you were hearing. In other words, Mark was w written way too early for legends to have been able to start developing. Mark is writing to primarily a Gentile or Roman audience. Um, it's the time of the, the Roman Empire, and he is wanting to, as I said, on page after page, to make it clear to them that Jesus Christ is not just a mighty conquering hero, but has come to bring about that kingdom through suffering and even death. Here's what I think is the main idea of this last passage in Mark chapter 8. And if I'm doing this correctly, the, this main idea, my main idea, is also the main idea of the passage. The main idea of the passage should always give rise to the main idea of the message. Here's what I think is that main idea. The world says, deny Jesus and follow your heart. Jesus says, deny yourself and follow me. The world says, deny Jesus and follow your heart, especially today in the 21st century. But Jesus says, no, 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 deny yourself and follow me. We're going to think about this main idea in two simple points. First, see the path. That's verses 31 to 33. And second, do the math. That's verses 34 to 38. So see the path and do the math. First, see the path. Look there at verse 31. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, and the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. So, for the first time in Mark's gospel, Jesus is previewing what's to come for him. He's previewing his fate. He's going to be arrested, tortured, killed, but three days later, he's going to get up from the dead. But why does Mark summarize the words of Jesus by saying that the Son of Man must suffer? Isn't that a little odd? I mean, we, we would kind of expect Jesus to say, the Son of Man will suffer. But Mark makes it clear that no, Jesus was teaching that the Son of Man not just will, but must suffer. Well, that's significant because it, it, it's a clue. It, it's a hint that Jesus is not just talking about his future. He's talking about his obedience. 
I mean, as we, we enter the Christmas season this year, it, it's just worth realizing, recognizing, remembering that the incarnation, God becoming a man, God taking on human flesh to redeem us, that that whole strategy was not just random happenstance. It wasn't just something that God chose from among a variety of possible options. No, it was the plan that God in his infinite sovereign wisdom had ordained from before the beginning of the world. This is not a new thing with Jesus on the the streets of Galilee. No, the kingdom, this has always been the plan of God. Plan A, the kingdom must come through the cross. Salvation must be accomplished through suffering. It all must happen according to God's original and only plan. There is no alternative. And I think that that word must also implies that Jesus is no mere victim of events. Jesus is an active agent. He knows what's going to happen. In fact, he is orchestrating these events in order to carry out his father's purpose. I'm reminded of what he says in John chapter 10 in the Good Shepherd discourse where he says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have authority to lay it down and authority to take it up again. We're not there yet, but when the time comes, men are going to take his life ultimately only because he hands it to them. Verse 32 he spoke plainly about this. So in other words, he's not, he's not playing games with Peter and the disciples. He's not trying to be enigmatic. We know sometimes that's the case. We've learned that the parables have this dual function where they reveal to some and they conceal to others. That's not what's going on here. Mark tells us that Jesus spoke plainly about his coming fate. Verse 32, he spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to worship him. No. (laughs) Peter rebukes him. The, The student is now instructing and even scolding the master, the teacher. I can just imagine Peter saying something to the effect of, this can't be right, Jesus. Surely there's got to be some other way. Let's figure out some other kind of plan because the stuff you just mentioned that you just ticked off, that cannot happen to you. See, Peter and the disciples have no category for a suffering and dying Messiah. They're expecting him to take the throne, to overcome and overthrow Roman oppression as a conquering political savior. They cannot fathom the Messiah as a corpse. There also might be a kind of a self-protective impulse here. Because when the disciples hear Jesus say that he's going to suffer and die, they rightly conclude, well, if that's what's going to happen to him, then that's probably what's going to happen to us. This is an emergency situation for Peter. He has got to convince Jesus to reroute his plans. There has got to be a better way, a different way to bring about the kingdom. One commentator puts it very well, I think. He says, quote, The disciples can understand God's plan only after the fact because it runs counter to everything they were conditioned to expect. Lofty visions of majesty fill up their eyes and the noise of cheering crowds plugs up their hearing so that Jesus' teaching about suffering and death flies in one ear and out the other. It is all a muddle to them. See, God's plan, if we're honest, and we just reflect on our own hearts and lives and doubts in light of a crisis like this for Peter and the disciples, we know that God's plans are often contrary to what we understand or expect, to what we think is is right. His ways, the prophet Isaiah says, are not our 
ways. Of course, this kind of confusion and consternation can happen on on different levels, right? It can happen on a global level. As we scan the headlines for, of world events and as we hear stories about what our brothers and sisters in Christ are experiencing around the world, as we hear about cr- grinding poverty and, and violence in places far flung around the globe, we can just start to think, how in the world is this God's best plan? I mean, yes, I understand that we live in a fallen world and so we should expect brokenness, but it sure doesn't feel like He's in the driver's seat. It can also happen on kind of a national level as we just feel so frustrated and, and angered over the polarization and the division in our culture, especially in recent years. I mean, why would God permit that? Why would he permit the, the fracturing, not just of political parties, but of friendships and families? But of course, it hits closest to home, not on the global level or the national level, but on a personal level. Lord, what are you thinking? Omar talked about this last week in Psalm 4, verse 1. Answer me, O God. Lord, Lord, what are you thinking? What are you doing in permitting this in my life? I mean, this, this thing that... I don't think is a very good thing you've permitted or this thing that I've been begging you for that I know is a good thing according to your word that you're withholding. See, we're not as far removed from Peter as we may like to think. The, the kind of dissonance, the, the disillusionment that can set in when our hopes and dreams and expectations come crashing into God's inviolable plan. Well, Peter, in this scene, if you remember, I mean, he's coming off kind of a spiritual high. I mean, he's just answered the question that I referenced earlier, who do people say I am? You're the Messiah, ding, ding, ding. Like, that's his most triumphant moment. That was the greatest thing he has ever said. And here in the very next scene, This is the worst thing. We hear the worst thing Peter has ever said. I mean, he may have kind of fancied himself coming down from that spiritual mountaintop as Jesus' personal advisor, but Jesus quickly corrects him. Peter's not going to reroute Jesus. Jesus reroutes him. Verse 33, but when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. A few things here to notice. First of all, just by the way, if you struggle to think or believe that that Mark is reporting real history, and by the way, let uh, let me just give you an under the hood look on why I do this. Why do I address the skeptic? Sometimes you might think, well, Matt, what if there is not a skeptic in here. Well, first of all, I don't think we should assume that. But second of all, I'm doing it for you to model how you might talk with your unbelieving, skeptical family members and neighbors and coworkers and friends. We should all read our Bibles with eyes toward and ears open for the kinds of things that would, that would feel literally unbelievable. Unbelievable to the average person on the street in Richmond today. And I just want to note in passing, if you don't believe Mark is reporting real history, but is reporting something else, say legends about Jesus, maybe arranged by the early church for some kind of political purpose, I just wonder, how do you make sense of, how do you explain the decision to include a sentence like this? Get behind me, Satan. Jesus said to the chief leader of the early church. I don't mean Peter was the Pope, but I mean Jesus was the spokesperson for the disciples. I mean, if you were trying to get a movement off the ground, would you do so by talking about a time where Jesus compared your chief spokesman to Satan? 
No, it's probably there because it actually happened, not because it was convenient to include. Another thing to notice here in verse 33, how did Mark know that Jesus had said this? Mark was not one of the 12 disciples. Mark didn't hear this exchange directly. No, Mark heard about this from Peter. There was a point at which Peter said, I've got to tell you about the time Jesus called me Satan, and you need to include it in your gospel. You need to include this, Mark, because I was dead wrong. And people need to understand why. Well, another thing is we've still got to answer the question, what does Jesus mean? Why does he call Peter Satan? Well, I think it's because in trying to talk Jesus out of the cross, which is what Peter's doing, he's trying to talk Jesus out of the cross, he's functioning, Peter is functioning just like the devil did back in the wilderness. When he tempted Jesus, remember that? To bow down and gain the kingdoms of the world without needing to walk the path of suffering. Of course, Peter didn't realize it, but he was acting as an agent of satanic deception by speaking against the will of God. He's tempting Jesus here to consider an easier path than the one that Jesus knows is the only path. Oh, friends, see, this this type of thinking, this is not an innocent mistake. If you think it's an innocent mistake, then Jesus will come across as just really harsh here. But this is not innocent. This is satanic to the core. Now, even that word might seem a little over the top to you, but that's because we tend to think of satanic activity as this kind of always explicit, over-the-top, blasphemous conduct. But what's really satanic, fundamentally, is worldly wisdom that has no need for a bloody cross. And the idea, this idea of of a bloody, bruised Messiah, it shouldn't have been so inconceivable to the disciples They and the Jewish leaders are without excuse. I mean, listening to Jesus' prediction, here's what's going to happen. I'm telling you plainly, I'm going to get arrested and tortured and killed. That should have caused something to ring a bell. They should have been thinking and hearing of the, the echo of an ancient scroll from 700 years before. Turn with me now to Isaiah chapter 53. Isaiah 53, it's fine if you need to use the table of contents to find it. The reason I want to take you there and have you look at it for yourself is because this is one of the most important Old Testament chapters for you to be familiar with. If you're a Christian and you have no idea why I'm taking you to Isaiah 53, I really want to challenge you to get to know your Bible better because this is a load-bearing chapter in the Old Testament. Let's start reading in Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4. We'll read verse 4 through the end of the the chapter. Isaiah is talking about a future male descendant from the line, not just of Israel, but of David, a messianic royal figure, and here is what he promises is going to happen to this man. Isaiah 53, starting in verse 4, Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away, yet who of his generation protested? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was punished. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death. Though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth, yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life an offering for sin, and here's a little preview, a little whisper, indicating that this suffering and death isn't going to be the end of the Messiah's story. Verse 10, in the middle, He will see His offspring and prolong His days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in His hand. Verse 11 is also a hint of the resurrection. After He has suffered, He will see the light of life. And be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. If you have no clue what what any of that is about, then you came on a good Sunday because this is the white hot center of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Though this was written seven centuries before Jesus came, this previewed and predicted what he would undergo and why. God has made a personal appearance on earth in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And after living for 33 years of unflinching, perfect obedience to his Father in heaven, he stepped into the sandals of this ancient figure from Isaiah 53. Jesus lived out this prophecy This is the very thing that in Mark 8, Jesus is predicting. He's telling the disciples, Isaiah 53 is going to happen to me. And Peter takes him aside to scold him. But Jesus can just point to this very chapter. And it tells us not just what will happen, but as I said, it shows us why. Not just the meaning, but the significance. On the cross, Jesus bore the wrath of God, the righteous, holy wrath of God in the place of sinners. He was numbered, as we just read, with the transgressor, with the transgressors. Jesus was not a transgressor. He was not a sinner, but he was numbered as a sinner, treated as a sinner, so that you, if you put your faith in him, if you believe that he died for sin and rose again three days later, and that he will save anyone who comes to him in trust, then you too can be treated by God in a way that you don't deserve. Jesus was treated in a way he didn't deserve. He was perfect, and yet he was treated like a sinner. You, through faith, can be treated like you don't deserve. Though you're a sinner, you can be treated as perfect in the eyes of a holy God. That is the gospel. That is the message that we have rallied around here as this particular outpost of the kingdom of heaven here in Richmond, Virginia. Our church will rise and fall based on our clinging to, not just confessing with our mouths, but treasuring with our hearts this incredible gospel of a sin-bearing, wrath-absorbing substitute in the place of sinners like you and me. So the Son of Man... Peter is quickly learning, the disciples are learning, will not come initially as a mighty military hero, but as a suffering servant. And Jesus wants to be very clear, his kingdom path is not going to make an end run around the cross. So see the path. Second, do the math. Do the math. Verse 34 
Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. So Jesus here is pivoting from addressing Peter and the disciples to addressing the multitude. And man, I just love the expansiveness of that word here. Whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple can be. Whoever wants to follow me can. Not in the sense that there's this natural moral ability in people to do so, but in the sense that the offer, the invitation goes out to everyone. Just as we thought about in Mark chapter 4 in the parable of the sower. The, the seed, the word of the gospel is sown, it's spread indiscriminately to all. Whoever wants to be my disciple But there are some conditions, and Jesus loves us too much to bury them in the fine print. This is a truth and advertising king that we have to deal with here. And what is he saying? What are the the conditions? Well, he's saying, again, it's not just a private scene with Peter. Now he's standing in front of a multitude. He's essentially saying, go ahead, look around as as far as your eye can see. I have plenty of curious onlookers. I have plenty of admirers. But I'm looking for something else. I'm not looking for onlookers. I'm not looking for admirers. I'm looking for followers. Those willing to pause and ponder and take stock of whether they're really willing to come after me. To put it a bit poetically, it's as if Jesus is saying, you want to follow me? Just know that it's not going to be a, a road lined with roses. If anything, it's going to be lined with splinters from crosses born and Maybe some of you are already thinking about the classic book by the German pastor during World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, The Cost of Discipleship. He's famous, Bonhoeffer is famous for for this one sentence in that book, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. But I want to read the quote in its context, which we don't often hear. Bonhoeffer writes, quote, the cross is laid on every Christian. The first Christ suffering which every man must experience is the call to abandon the attachments of this world. As we embark upon discipleship, we surrender ourselves to Christ in union with his death. We give over our lives to death. Thus it begins. The cross is not the terrible end to an otherwise God-fearing and happy life, but the cross meets us at the beginning of our communion with Christ. When Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. It may be a death like that of the first disciples who had to leave home and work to follow him. Or it may may be a death like Martin Luther's who had to leave the monastery and go out into the world. But it is the same death every time. Death in Jesus Christ. The death of our old man the death of our old man at his call. In other words, this is not just about a kind of one-time act of obedience. Jesus is not talking about walking an aisle. He's talking about carrying a cross. This is, this is about a lifestyle, day in and day out, of putting to death the encumbrances, the temptations, the conveniences of life. Not just the bad things, but sometimes the good things we have to give up in order to inconvenience ourselves to serve others and to glorify God. It's not about just showing the world how radical you are. It's about saying no to self-regard in the most mundane moments of your life. I think it's really easy for us as people who are struggling in relationships, for example, 
maybe it's a spouse, maybe it's a roommate, maybe it's a coworker, to come to a text like this and just think only about martyrdom. Jesus doesn't want you to first and foremost think about are you willing to die if someone holds a knife to your throat and asks you, do you trust Christ? He's asking you, are you willing to die today in private with that person who is difficult to love? Are you willing to die to your preferences and to your rights, to give up your comfort, to give up your convenience in order to do them spiritual good? That's the real test. That's the real cost of discipleship. But if you've experienced the cost of discipleship, if you've walked this road at all, you know that something counterintuitive happens. You know that in taking up your cross, joining Jesus on this kind of death march, it's no longer about you and your life, about your status with you at the center of your little kingdom. It's about Christ and his priorities and his status and his plan. There's joy to be found there. I mean, it sounds like a death sentence, but in reality, when you step into it, when you follow the suffering servant and the Savior, you find true life, which is the very thing that he talks about in the next verse, verse 35. For whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and for the gospel will save it. He's saying if your heart values your life, if you value your life in the final analysis, if you value your life above me, Jesus is saying, then you will lose your life. But if you value me above your life, not perfectly, not in every moment, but consistently and more and more so as you get closer to to Christ, if you value me above even your life, then you will gain it. And again, it's just one of these counterintuitive things that you can only experience if you're in it. You, you kind of have to step out in faith and take the risk of following Jesus in order to experience the thrilling freedom and life-giving joy that is only found on that Calvary road. Verse 36, Jesus continues. He's just here, here in these verses, 35, 36, 37, 38, he's just elaborating on what it means to deny yourself and take up your cross and follow him. He's giving some, some reasons, some incentives for why that's worth doing. Verse 36, what good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? As Garrett said rightly earlier in the service, the implied answer is nothing. There is nothing you can do or give in exchange for your soul. This is an amazing little verse. What good is it to gain the whole world and yet forfeit your soul? Which means that a soul is worth more than a world. Have you ever considered that your soul is more valuable then all the treasures, all the status, all the popularity, all the acceptance, all the success that this world cumulatively might have to offer you. Yesterday, I finished a, a book by Matthew Perry. Uh, Matthew Perry is most famous for playing Chandler on the TV show Friends. Now, let me be clear. I am not commending the show Friends. I've actually probably only seen three episodes in my life, uh, and I'm not even commending the book, but I did have someone tell me that as a pastor, I really should read it because it is a unusually insightful, embracing deep dive into the human condition. It's, it's Matthew Perry. Some of you may know about his struggles with um, alcohol and drug abuse, and it, it, it's a raw and visceral and illuminating revealing of what it's like to gain the whole world. At one point early on, Perry writes, quote, the fame was everything I thought I wanted. I was going to fill all the holes inside with 
friends with the show friends. People were going to like me now. I was going to be enough. But would fame, that elusive lover, really fill all the holes I carried around with me? And the whole book is basically him answering that question, no. He writes, I am constantly filled with a lurking loneliness, a yearning, clinging to the notion that something outside of me will fix me. But I'd had all that the outside had to offer. I think you have to get famous to know that it's not the answer. Perry considers himself a a spiritual seeker. There are moments in the book when you think this man is, is not far from the kingdom. Other points in the book you think he is far from the kingdom. But he believes in God and he, he, is, he describes himself as a seeker. He writes, that beatific moment is something I still seek. I want a connection to something bigger than me because I'm convinced it's the only thing that will truly save my life. I don't want to die. I'm scared to die. But later he admits, quote, I never let myself feel uncomfortable long enough to have a spiritual connection. So I fix it with pills and alcohol before God can jump in and fix me. Reading this searching memoir reminded me of of one of my favorite quotes by Charles Spurgeon when he, he said, consider how precious a soul must be when both God and the devil are after it. Your soul is worth more than a world. And it is so precious that God and the devil are after your soul. I'm reminded of a couple Old Testament verses, which which I want to show you because unlike Isaiah 53, I highly doubt these are ones you're you're very familiar with, but they're, um, uh, well, I should say, you may be familiar with them. I'm not trying to insult you, but they're not as, they're not as well, nearly as well known as Isaiah 53, but I want them to be on your radar and you can feel free to write down um, these references in the margin next to Mark chapter eight. I'll just read them for you. Psalm 47, seven to nine. No one can redeem the life of another or give to God a ransom for them. The ransom for a life is costly. No payment is ever enough so that they should live on forever and not see decay. Can you hear the echo in what Jesus is saying in Mark 8? And the other is Proverbs 11.4. Proverbs 11.4. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Wealth is worthless in the day of wrath, but righteousness delivers from death. Speaking of the day of wrath, verse 38, Mark 8, 38. If anyone, Jesus says, if anyone, there's the word again, anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. This is another sobering prediction because it's not just that Jesus is going to be handed over, arrested, betrayed, tortured, crucified, and raised. But there's also going to be a day when he opens the clouds and he returns to make all things new. But as part of that rescue mission, he is also going to judge those who have not bowed their knee to him. Philippians chapter 2 talks about how the, at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. That does not mean everyone will eventually be saved. That means that everyone will bow their knee to Christ. Everyone in this room will bow their knee to the nail-scarred Messiah. The only question is, are you going to do it now, willingly, or are you going to do it then? Because you're standing before not a Savior, but a judge. This is sobering stuff. And when we read something like Jesus saying, if anyone is ashamed of me, this doesn't mean that you, you never get embarrassed, that you never 
miss or blow a gospel opportunity, but it means that if you live a life of consistent, if there's a consistent refrain, a consistent pattern in your life of recoiling, shrinking back from allegiance to Christ, just as Peter would later do when he denies Jesus three times. Well, then Jesus says that if you're not going to own me, I'm not going to own you. If if you're not going to, if you're not going to stand with me and follow me, then I'm not going to claim you as my own. There will be many on the final day who say to me, Lord, Lord, didn't I do all this amazing stuff, ministry stuff in your name? And he will respond, depart from me, you evildoers. I don't know you. I mean, there's a big difference between walking up to the White House and saying to the Secret Service agent, I know the president, would you please let me in? and the president walking out and saying, I know that guy, please let him in. It's important that we know Christ, but ultimately the question is, does Christ know you? Will he look at you on that final day and say, enter into the joy of your master? And doing this has never been easy. Standing for Christ, not shrinking in shame from Christ, it has never been easy, but I would go so far as to say that for many of us, it's never been more challenging than it is in America today. Hear me clearly. I'm talking specifically about America. In the history of this country, for many of us, not all of us, this is as hard as it's ever been because there's a cost associated with just simply claiming the name of Christ. I mean, in previous just decades in this country, being a church-going person was, a, was an asset on a social resume. Now, being a church-going person may well be a liability. I mean, we used to be viewed as quaint people who take seriously an ancient book. Now, You taking seriously the Bible, believing the words of the Bible, living in light of the words of the Bible won't get you dismissed with an eye roll. Oh, isn't that, isn't that sweet? Uh, Christians just believe all those ancient fables. No, it'll actually make people see you as a moral outlaw. It's offensive now to believe much of what the Bible teaches This verse, by the way, verse 38, is is just a good verse to have in our hearts and ringing in our ears as we enter the holidays and we're spending time with family members and friends that don't yet know Jesus. My one admonition for you is just don't wait and wait and wait for the perfect moment, the perfect ideal scenario, because if you wait for that, then you won't have many gospel opportunities in your life. Now, I'm not encouraging you to be socially awkward, much less a jerk, but I don't think our danger is being too quick to speak of Jesus. I think it's being too slow to speak of Jesus. I mean, in other countries, many other countries, they fear the raised fist. For us, if we're honest, we often fear the raised eyebrow. We need to take seriously the fact that our, t- our life is finite, time is short, forever is a long time. And rather than passing up gospel opportunities because they're not perfect, not ideal, we need to simply seize and steward the ones God has given us now. Well, in conclusion, Jesus doesn't call us. This is one of the things I love about the Lord Jesus. He doesn't call us to do anything that we that he himself hasn't already done i mean he tells us to take up our cross which is the very thing that's going to happen in mark chapter 15 where he takes up his own cross and he completes his own death march to jerusalem to golgotha where just as he predicted here in mark 8 he's handed over arrested betrayed abandoned tortured and pinned on a crossbeam between two thieves. John Stott puts it like this, quote, despite the great importance of his teaching, his example, and his works of compassion and power, 
none of these was central to his mission. Praise God for the the teaching, example, and works of compassion and power, but none, Stott says, were central to his mission. What dominated Christ's mind was not the living, but the giving of his life. The final self-sacrifice was his hour for which he had come into the world. And because he carried his cross, we can follow in his steps, not as a way to atone for sin, but as a way to worship the one who already has. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we praise you for sending Christ to live the perfect life that we've failed to live. Lord, we are those who stumble and fall and and we do pass up opportunities to speak of you. We do shrink back in fear and shame. We do stumble along, but we praise you that as, as, as your word says elsewhere, we are not ashamed because we know whom we have believed. It's not, Lord, that we're not ashamed because we know how we've believed, but because we know whom we have believed. And so, Lord, we thank you that ultimate security and ultimate rest is not found in our great faith, but in our great Savior. And it's in his beautiful name that we pray. Amen.